Welcome to Talk Me Healthy. Each show, we invite a guest to explore a topic related to healthy living. They share their expertise and personal stories, and we learn from them how they turn their passion and knowledge into practical tips that you can use now to improve your health. I'm your host, Sherry Keating, founder of Diabetes Care Consulting. My goal is that each show you will hear something that will motivate you to make a small but significant change towards living a healthier and happier life. Hello and welcome to Talk Me Healthy. My name is Sherry Keating and I'm your host. Today's show we're going to be talking about 20 nonprofit organization 220. And my two guests today are Dan Jarvis. He's the founder of 220, also a military, retired military vet and also retired from law enforcement. Yes, ma'am. And then also we have Nick Davis, who is also a military vet. And um, Board of on the board of directors of twenty two zero as well as a certified practitioner for RTM. So right. thank you both. First of all, I want to thank you for your service because my dad was also in the military and my husband is also a military veteran. So um, thank you for all you do to serve our country. Well, just want to let you know you're worth it. Yeah. Oh, American thank people are definitely you. Awesome. That's awesome. And I am so excited to have you on the show to talk about this amazing work that you're doing. I actually had an opportunity to observe the RTM protocol, and um, I'm excited to uh, talk to you more about this. But I kind of want to know a little bit about yourselves and kind of what brought you to do found, founding this, mm-hmm. and then, Nick, why you're involved in this. So would you mind sharing that with us? Sure. So... In 2011, I was uh, an infantry squad leader in Afghanistan, um, and during that deployment, half my kids were medevaced out of country um, from combat injuries. One of the kids uh, that I was with was killed in action, and I felt responsible for it. Um, and in July of 2011, I stepped on a pressure plate, which detonated an IED about five feet away, and I received a pretty significant traumatic brain injury. Um, and I was off the battle roster for maybe a week, and I was fighting clawing, just trying to get back on the battle roster. But I was sleep deprived after that event. And my job when we lost Doug was I was in a striker unit, so I was in the lead vehicle, and my job was to find the IEDs before we hit it, so that we would bring up the explosives guys. And on August 19th, 2011, I heard the explosion in the back of the convoy, so we had rolled over it, and they detonated it on one of our vehicles. And that's when we lost Doug. And, and that's when I, I, I really, I, was, I think I was more angry at myself because um, I didn't speak up and say, hey, <laughs> I'm exhausted. I'm not sleeping. I mean, I was practically a zombie and, and doing combat operations. I should let somebody else take the front. So I blame myself for losing Doug. Um, and then at the end of the deployment, uh, I got a Red Cross notice and my mom had uh, had a massive heart attack. And there was a four-day window it took me to get home and i had no communication and and i didn't make it home in time to say goodbye so Mm -hmm. i i live with that and after the funeral i find myself back in alaska uh, stationed at fort wainwright and i was still sleep deprived first thing i did when i got back there is i got a case of beer and basically drank till i passed out and then i realized oh i can sleep but it's going to cost me you know six pack 12 pack of beer a night so this went on for probably a good 11 months and the nightmares were so bad and, and the, the thoughts always bombarding you, the, the guilt associated with losing somebody and he was an only child and, and watching his mom post things on Facebook. It was just like, you know, my guts were being ripped out repeatedly and the depression was just horrible. And I hit it very well. Nobody had a clue that I was struggling. And, and as a leader in the military, there's really no, you know, who, what do you do? Do you say I need help? You know, because then you don't want to lose the respect of your men. You don't want to lose the respect to your commanders. Mm -hmm. And I made the decision that it would be easier to end my own life. Mm -hmm. So it was March 2nd. um, I was looking at a rifle in the corner of my room. And I was like, you know, just take one second and the pain would be over. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to die. I just didn't want the pain to continue. Mm -hmm. And I thank God I heard the kids in the apartment above me. And it just kind of took me out of the moment. I'm like, well, I can't. That's I don't want to hurt a kid. You know, Mm -hmm. high power rifle is going to go right through. And then the next morning I get a phone call. Um, Ryan was one of my, he was my driver, one of my riflemen. 
asked if I'd heard about Corey, and I'm like, no, what, what's going on? And he said, Corey shot and killed himself last night. And Corey was a 22-year-old soldier. Um, he had a kid, a wife, and, you know, nobody had a clue. that He was just, he was like the happiest soldier. I mean, he was in the football world. We would have called him a coach's player, the kind of guy that did everything he was asked to do. Um, and then I just realized at that moment, I said, well, nobody had a – Nobody had a clue that I was struggling. Mm -hmm. um, and that week, we, we led up to the memorial service, you know, realizing how it affected the men. Um, and I saw how emotionally it impacted them. And I realized at that point, that this can't be my option. There's no way I'm going to get permission to one of my guys to do the same thing. So I just fought it, and I struggled, and I still drank. And then September 11th, 2014, I'd had surgery on both of my shoulders by this time, and my left knee, and, and I was in my 40s. And... We're in the middle of the drawdown, and, and the Army says, we no longer need your services. We need somebody younger and healthier. So I was medically retired. I took the uniform off, and I'm like, well, now what? You know, mm -hmm. My whole identity has just been ripped away. Mm -hmm. So I'm back in Florida, and, and I'm still doing the drinking and things of that nature. Um, and then I realized I've got to do something. I, I can't continue this way. And so I'm, I'm working on my physical health, my uh, emotional health, my spiritual health. Um, you know, and then I ended up, um, going back to work in law enforcement and I felt good for a while, uh, because you know, the thing in the, in the law enforcement world or any first responder profession, you work in the fight or flight, that's your mm -hmm. career. So you're always up here. And, and while you're up there, when you have PTS, um, you feel normal because that's the way the brain's supposed to react. And then I had some other health issues with my back, um, from the combat injuries and, and my wife and I discussed it and we're like, well, maybe it's time. You know, the wife is an interesting, we, I didn't get married until after the military. Mm -hmm. um, and then I left the sheriff's office and that's when everything came back because now I'm no longer operating up here. Mm -hmm. I'm down here mm -hmm. and my brain neurology is wired for up here. And then the nightmares came back and I would sweat so bad the sheets would be soaking wet because I'm, I'm pretty much doing cardio in my sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and then my wife is like, you've got to do something. You've got to get help because I don't know. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I go to the VA and, you know, as most veterans do when they come out, they gave me a clinical diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder with major depressive disorder. Uh, and the only two things that I heard in that conversation was disorder, disorder. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to hear those words. Um, and I'm like, well, now what? So then they put me through um, some therapy. They call it prolonged exposure. And that's where you talk and tell the whole event. And they just open the emotional wounds mm -hmm. and... And they had canceled a couple of appointments on me. It's supposed to be weekly. And the first cancellation, I couldn't get in for four weeks. And then I couldn't get in for eight weeks. And then I just said, I'm done with the VA. Mm. Um, they're just, it's not the, I mean, I'm not picking on the VA. The mm -hmm. VA is overwhelmed. They don't have the, um, the, t the techniques, you know, that we're learning now. Uh, so my wife ended up inviting some, a gentleman to come to do some leadership training at the sheriff's office because she's a, an executive there. And he invited me to come to a men's retreat weekend and I did. And that's where I met Nick. Um, and I was sitting there in the room and I'm like, you know, trying to figure out what's next in my life. What do I do? He wasn't just sitting in the room. It was, it was there was probably 15 of us in that one small spot out in the woods in Florida. And, and I could see it all over him. He's kind of in the corner tucked away and I'm, yeah. I'm introducing the guys cause I'd been in part of the group for a couple of years and, I go around the room and I'm like, man, that guy's, he's, he's really jammed up. He's I, I didn't know a story. Like I didn't kind know. of totally. isolating himself. <clears throat> yep. He was in the middle of that fight with uh, PTS and, uh, and it was, I don't mean to jump on your thunder there, but it was six months later that we came back together and, and you can kind of tell what happened in between there. But when we came back together six months later, He's like, he is now. He's like, hey, how's, how's it going? Life's good. Man, so I'm what like, changed you? <clears throat> well, another, another gentleman, Tom Padilla, that I met on that same weekend is involved with raising funds for another nonprofit called the Research and Recognition Project. And he was telling me about this new PTS treatment that will eradicate PTS. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So. And this is the RTM. This is the RTM. RTM so protocol, yeah. He, yeah. He, the, Dr. Burke, the founder of the protocol from, from Research and Recognition, um, he's a research scientist, so he finished his studies with the five replication studies. He wouldn't go public with it until all the baseline research was done because he knows that world, that the only way to get this thing accepted into the mainstream is to have the research. Mm -hmm. So I go out to Albuquerque. Tom invited me out there, and I'm for one full day, I'm sitting listening to the instruction on this, and 
they're making claims like 92 to 96 percent, depending upon which study you're looking at. And, and it's effective, you're it, saying. Effect, in, fact, in other words, you have PTSD, you go through the treatments, three to five sessions, a week later you're evaluated, and you no longer qualify for a diagnosis. So, because they, they approach it as, um, it, it's a, this intervention is neurological, it's not psychological. Hmm. So, I told the lead trainer, I says, well, you know, I, I had already started 22 years because my whole mission is I want to be able to connect veterans that are falling away from the VA system to alternative resources, you know, so that's oh, what we were so looking that's for. that's why you found it 22 That's why we found it 22 When I realized I dropped off the radar and the fact that they never called to ask where I was, okay. how many people are in that boat? Right, so they're, they're no longer going to the VA, but they don't have any resources. So that's where 22 came. Okay. Yes. And why 22 zero? What does that name mean? In, in the United States, the accepted number, or on average, we're losing 22 veterans every day. It's, wow. it's a little over 8,000 a year. And this is vets, not to mention first responders. Yeah, that's not even first responders. So you initially started for vets, though, but now it's expanded to... Well, because I was a first responder, I wanted it to be for both. Okay. Because so vets and first responders. The biggest problem with PTS is the stigma associated with it. Yeah. And what we're really trying to do is, is crush the stigma. Yeah. Because if you can affect... Let me go back to Albuquerque. So I, I, I tell this guy, I want to try this thing. And he says, we well, want to do it today. I'm like, sure, let's do it. And then he goes, how about in 10 minutes in front of the class? And I'm like, okay, no problem. So I'm sitting in a chair in front of 30 mental health counselors in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And in 45 minutes, uh, we run this protocol. I started telling him the event, and then he stopped me. And I'm, as well, I want to talk. No, we don't want to talk. All we want to do is get, all they want to do is get a little bit of a reaction, what they call a parasympathetic reaction, mm -hmm. to activate the emotions. And then they, they ground you, and then they set up this protocol. And in 45 minutes, I look over at the trainer, and I'm like, what kind of Jedi stuff is this? Because I felt the emotional shift like that. Really? It was that fast. And went back to my hotel room that night, and I crashed. I slept. And what they believe happens is the, the amygdala, mm -hmm. that's the base part of the brain, yeah. that's the fight or flight part, mm -hmm. that's where the memories for PTS stores. Okay. So it's kind of like when you're a kid and you burn your hand with a candle, you know never to put your hand in fire mm -hmm. because that memory is automatically accessible right there. Same thing with trauma. That's why you have the nightmares. That's why you have the flashbacks. That's why you have the intruding thoughts. That's why you have the triggers. Um, and what this does is it neurologically shuts off that connection and it reconsolidates the memory. It's that first sleep cycle where the memory gets processed and moves to the long term. Now they've done the QEEG studies, the brain scans, where mm -hmm. you have PTS and it lights up mm -hmm. all the brain waves, you know, seven to 10 days later, normal brain wave activity. Wow, that's amazing. So they'll eventually develop a biomarker for PTS. Yeah. Um, that's probably more research, but they do know that it works. They don't know how it works. Uh, Dr. Burke says that's about 20 more years of research. So after experiencing this, I came back and I went to a counselor who had just finished the training and, and that came up from Florida and I did the rest of my work. Um, people need to understand the, the, the trauma that I was exposed to was definitely military, was definitely law enforcement, but the worst stuff that, that I was impacted by was things that happened when I was 11 that I had absolutely zero control over. Um, so I, I cleared the emotional event with my mother and then Doug and then an event when I was a child and it's like five sessions I did. That was all I, I did. And it was like... Getting your life back. I'm like, I really wanted to do work on more stuff, but I didn't feel it anymore. So, so if you clear... Well, we'll talk about what that means. But if you clear one trauma, does that clear others while you're clearing that one trauma? It can. Your brain can start functioning unconsciously how to do the, setting this stuff up. Um, but the objective is if you can find the first traumatic event in your life and the worst like traumatic event. way back. Event, way back. The first traumatic event and the worst traumatic event. Because what happens is when that 7-year-old is traumatized or that 11-year-old is traumatized and they have a severe emotional reaction and then they get traumatized again when, say, they're 20, they neurologically connect. Mm. So what happens is all of the traumas will connect to the same thing. So if you can sever the connection on the first one and the worst one, the rest just kind of dissipate. So can we talk about the protocol? Sure. Because uh, people, do, you know, you're talking about being cleared and what all that means. So uh, tell me about this protocol. Uh, one thing I wanted to hit too that Dan just said is that if anybody, anybody that watches this or, or is hearing it on a podcast that um, 
this is not just for military veterans and first responders. That's the, the realm that Dan and I work heavily in mm -hmm. because we're both veterans and we're passionate. There's a lot of PTS in that area. Since I became a certified practitioner in our local Massachusetts area, um, I've probably cleared 10 to 15 people that were non-military. Um, things from, you know, people that were victims of rape to severe abuse. Um, one person woke up during a surgery and, uh, and was being intubated when they woke up mm -hmm. and that they couldn't function for the next year, severe anxiety. And that person no longer, it's all gone, mm -hmm. like no anxiety, good to go. So it's for the civilians or the people out there, we've been asked this a lot, like, yeah. Hey, you know, PTSD, traumatic, post-traumatic stress is post-traumatic stress. Right. It's not post-traumatic military first right. responder stress. We all have it. Many of us have lived through it. So, um, mm -hmm. The protocol itself, uh, you definitely jump in on me on this one, Dan, but for me, the first time I got to see it happen in person, because he was telling me, he was all excited. He's like, 22-0, we're going we're gonna to take it from 22 a day to zero, and all the veterans in the room are like, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> because we've heard of the other therapies, we knew right. there, there wasn't really a cure or fix out there, it's something that's solid. Um, uh, the one I had heard of was EMDR, which, which does help reduce symptoms, but it doesn't get rid of it. Um, and... So I watched it happen in person. I got trained and the, the first person that I worked with, um, was actually a woman that works with me and she's, she's an amazing person and had had a traumatic event that she had not shared with another person in 40 years. And when we set up the protocol, what we're doing, like Dan said, we're not, people don't have to relive the trauma. You don't have to tell me the whole story, mm -hmm. but honestly, you don't even have to tell us any of the story. Um, there's ways for us to, you can like basically pretend you're telling us a story and we can see the visible reaction in you. <clears throat> and then we, we do what we call bookend the event. So let's say I had an event where I was, uh, I was mugged at gunpoint. Well, I don't want to have to relive it because every time I do that emotion, that stress, right. the anxiety, it all comes into my PTSD. body. PTSD. <laughs> right. Yeah. So what, what were you doing maybe a day before or a week before the mm -hmm. event? So we find a bookend close to it. Okay. Maybe I was having lunch with dad. Mm -hmm. So that's our first bookend. And then we, well, what was, when did I know I was safe? The event was over maybe a day later, a week later. Okay. I was at the beach with my kids. Okay. Okay. So our movie is going to be whatever the name is. We're going to bookend it with lunch with dad and at the beach with the kids. Mm -hmm. And we, we get the person set up in a situation where they're basically in a movie theater setting to where they get comfortable, see the theater and they seat themselves in the theater. And then we have them leave their seated position and they float into the projection booth. And from the projection booth, this is what we call disassociation. Mm -hmm. So we have them <clears throat> put a basically black and white image of the um, lunch with dad mm -hmm. before anything happened you're yep. safe on the safe screen yeah. and their job is to stay in the booth and just watch the self themselves down in the theater that's seated mm -hmm. as that self watches the event starting with lunch with dad going all the way through the event to after the event was over and the person the self in the movie knew that they were safe and they were at the beach at with the, the kids beach, yeah. Because the brain a lot will process the movie, mm -hmm. and oftentimes when we first set this up, and you got to kind of see a little bit, I did. The, the person will reassociate. They'll be watching right. the movie. They're watching the movie, not watching the person who's watching the movie. Right, and soon as they, so, and sometimes we have to do multiple levels of disassociation. You know, and it doesn't mean that your PTS is worse or better than some. It's it's just how your brain functions. So sometimes we'll. You know, you push a movie screen out, you bring somebody mm -hmm. on a balcony. I know this might sound a little crazy because you're thinking. So when you say disassociation, <clears throat> just for the viewers, you're saying, so remove yourself from that traumatic situation. Right. And that way it moves it from the amygdala to your long-term storage memory. Is that what you're saying? When we go through it. So when, when you, we can see when somebody gets to that point, you're like, got them because um, they, they basically will feel uncomfortable. They'll either see that they're uncomfortable in the theater or they don't really like where they're, they're, they're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So if they don't feel good the first time, let's say we go to a balcony and like, okay, oh, well, I didn't really feel anything there. That means that they're letting themselves disassociate. Mm -hmm. Both the, the movie's playing in black and white. They're not watching it. They're watching themselves as the, themselves in the theater is watching it. <clears throat> so you just get multiple uh, layers and then you bring it back in. And ultimately, once you get through that whole process, the person can generally talk about the event with almost no emotional response that, and to include the, um, my friend that works with me, she, she was like, this is amazing. I have no anxiety and I can talk about what happened to me. But the memory is still there, but it's Correct. just in a different part of the brain. So how come it doesn't 
like it's in your long-term memory. We can remember things in our long-term memory. So how come you don't remember that traumatic event in your long-term memory? Like, you know what I'm saying? Well, does that make sense? Yeah. Think of the amygdala as a thumb drive. Okay. You have easy access. You plug it into the computer. When it gets processed, it goes to the hard drive, which is the long term. It's kind of like try to find a file on your computer. It takes you a minute to get it. Yeah. So you don't have... You don't have the layers of emotions. The emotions are gone. Okay. Uh, the memory doesn't change. Okay, the, the memory is still, still there. there and, and you the matter, don't have the emotions. Matter of fact, people tend to remember more about the events after they do the, okay. the, the sessions. Uh, because the brain with trauma will delete and distort data, typically. will will suppress the information because the brain's trying to protect itself. Mm -hmm. And what the protocol does is it sets it up in a way, the black and white imagery is letting the brain know... Well, there's a still picture at the beginning. That's the beginning of the event. And then there's an end of the event. And it's in black and white. So when you think of a black and white movie, it's an old movie. Right. So unconsciously... Well, that's you, why you're doing it in black and white. Unconsciously, your brain is saying, okay, wait a minute. There's a beginning to the trauma and there's an end. I'm safe and I'm safe. And it's old. Oh, wait a minute. It's not for this purpose. Oh, it's... And that's when the brain... Because at that point, it can not It can no longer hold oh, on to it. Oh, that makes sense. It processes the memory... Um, so the memory's still there, but you've lost all that emotion, yes. and the emotion is what brings all those symptoms mm -hmm. on. Correct. Yeah. Oh, that we, makes sense. We literally just had a practitioner call us with um, somebody that she had cleared, and uh, the person was supposed to be dying of stomach cancer, had, had had severe trauma, been working with her for a long time, finally got her to go through the old RTM protocol. <clears throat> she called us in tears because the woman went to get um, a checkup, and she no longer has cancer. Really? She stopped taking medication two years. Now, we're not saying that this cures yeah, cancer. No, right? I'm not saying that. But the body does keep score. And yes. when you hold on to the trauma, right. it will store in the cellular level of the body. What she did was she cleared all the trauma. She released the trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and without medication or treatment, she no longer has cancer. So wow. so is this a one-shot deal? Like you go... So when you say cleared, you're saying that that memory with the emotion is now moved to the long-term storage mm -hmm. and the emotion is gone, but the memory still there. That's what you mean when you say a person's cleared. Right. Okay. Right. So is it a one <clears throat> treatment? I don't know if you call it a treatment, but one protocol sort of visit or it how de long? It depends on the, the nature of the trauma. Um, if it's a single event, I mean, I've done one session with people and they were done. Uh, I, a young lady I met in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, came over to my uncle's house. Uh, I was connected through another friend. She was married to a police officer. Um, she was so in internalized and so isolated and scared. I could see her. So I said, look, we don't need to know. What, I don't even need to know what you're working on. Let's go ahead and set this up. Um, she opened up a little bit when I shared my story with her. So I mm -hmm. said, let's run this. Mm -hmm. and let's see what happens. So we ran the protocol. And we saw the release. Her color flushed back into her face. She started smiling and she opened up and then started wow. talking normal. I said, okay, after we did the, the color rewind, I said, now tell me about the event. And she told me this horrific event when she was 18. She had moved a guy into her house. They were at, getting to the end of the relationship. They were splitting up. And the guy had brutally raped and tortured her for like hours. Wow. And I, when she told me that, I my job out hit the floor and I said, zero to 10, zero, no negative emotions, 10, where you came in, where are you right now? And she says, I'm like a one. Wow. And we did one other traumatic memory in that same session. And then the next morning I checked in with her and she was on cloud nine, no nightmares. So for 15 years, she relived this nightmare. So she would sleep an hour or two a night. She would medicate to sleep or, or do take a few cocktails to sleep. She slept through the whole night. Um, no startle responses, no. And she said she woke up the next morning and the physical pain associated with the trauma was gone. Oh, that's so, amazing. So she got her life back. She got her life back. And I, when I told Dr. Burke about that, he said, oh, my God, you about gave her a heart transplant because you're basically giving them a new heart at that point. Um, and checking in with her, and she's like, she doesn't have any triggers. She's got no negative emotions associated. She doesn't have the shame or guilt associated with the, with the torturing event. Um, and she's wanting to help anybody she can now, and it's remarkable. So how long have you been doing this, and um, how many people have you helped? Personally, well, September of 2018 is when I went through the treatment. Um, and we officially got trained December of 2019. Okay. Um, so you've been doing this just a sh you too have been doing this a short period of time. I've done You've it a little. Been I've been doing it a little bit longer because I've been to like five or six of their training events, okay. even though I've never been certified. But 
Dr. Burke re- asked me to go ahead and certify because just to a, protection. Yeah. So I've worked. I'm probably at about twenty people myself. And you, Nick, fifteen to twenty. So is this accepted in the medical community? It is. It's been published in the ISTSS 2019 journal. Uh, it's the International Studies of Traumatic. I don't know what the actual acronym is. Mm-hmm. It's considered emerging evidence okay. because you have to wait like five years to be considered evidence based. Yeah. Uh, but Walter Reed has just <laughs> finished their study comparing mm-hmm. it to the exposure therapy that the VA and the DOD uses. Um, and they're already reporting it, what their findings are, and they're using the protocol with the counselors that are trained at Walter Reed. So once that study publishes, it, that's a major study. The VA funded it. It was like a $700,000 study. Uh, that The naysayers at that point aren't going to have a dog in the fight because you have the, the most premier PTSD research center on the planet mm-hmm. is now endorsing this. And are people like knocking your doors down to get this? You, you would be surprised... <clears throat> We're, we're, we have been trying to get the licensed mental health world to get into this, but I'm not a counselor, so I don't speak the language, and a lot of them look at me like I'm crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why we've kind of gone the route we're going now. Mm-hmm. There are states that have licensing exemptions for counseling, um, nonprofits, government agencies, and um, churches um, have exemptions. Yeah. Massachusetts is one of those states. Florida is one of those states. And so we're able to train veterans to do peer-to-peer. And I'll give you an example. In uh, December, we finished, there were um, seven peer coaches trained, and then we had two licensed counselors that were, one was a veteran and one was an ex-cop that we sponsored. And then we sponsored another one that happened later in January. And between 10 of us since December 7th, we have worked with about 120 people that have lost their diagnosis for PTSD. So that for the for the dollar amount for us right now, I think we're at $67 a person. I was gonna ask you, how do you get your funding and it's free <laughs> to the person? Yeah, that's just, this isn't my career. I mean, you know Right, my you career. have a full-time career, right? right. So I, how do you fund uh, um, your nonprofit? Just sharing the stories, generosity. <laughs> we were selling t-shirts, you know, uh, we do a lot of stuff through Facebook. Um, we do have an event coming up this August. Yes. Before I forget, uh, Bronson Arroyo, the pitcher for the Red Sox. Yeah. He has Bronson Arroyo band, and he's going to be his band's coming up August tenth. It's a Monday. It's going to be uh, um, not necessarily a private event, but it's going to be limited. So we're going to be selling tickets to that event. Okay. Um, and we're going to do some pretty cool VIP stuff. Him and the band are going to hang out at our place afterwards and do a little jam session. And just uh, kick back with us, but we're going to be raising a lot of funds there. And that weekend, we may be doing something else to combine with it. Um, but yeah, a lot of everything we've been doing is this guy's been working 60 to 70 hours a week, just trying to keep things rolling. And we've been every day we're talking, trying to what, what can we do next to raise funds? All the money that comes to us in donations, 100 percent of it say, goes Ken, to. I want to find out how people can donate if yeah. they sure. want to. Yeah. So you said about donations before I interrupted you. That, that's okay. Yeah. It's basically any donations that come into twenty two zero. You can we're on Facebook or you can go right to our site, the twenty two zero dot org. Okay. And perfect. that's two two then the word zero z e r o dot org. And um, we'll put that on the web on the show, so you'll have that as well. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And any donations, um, the money is used to train more. Sp- People like me, military veterans, first responders that can come in and we'll start working in our communities. We're working with some churches. Yeah. Or it's just it's the ground up movement. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if we're having a hard time with some of the licensed people that are licensed professionals in the world uh, buying into this, we're going to just do it ourselves. And it, when I shook my head, yes, when you asked, are people buying into this? The people who hear the stories and they're like, oh, my gosh, my mom can't even go out in public right now. Can you sit with her? Mm -hmm. And she goes from not being able to go out in public to now she has her life back and life's good and nothing's wrong. So it's word of mouth, like amazing word of mouth testimonies. We we have about 10,000 followers on our Facebook um, and we we publish stories. We have our own podcast, the PTSD Free Podcast, and we'll send those links to veterans, first responders, and, hey, listen to what this veteran went through. And that builds the confidence for them to say, yes, I'll, I'll get help. Um, you know, and let's talk first responders for a second. We're losing more first responders nationally to suicide than line of duty deaths. My son is a police officer. Police, fire, EMS. Mm-hmm. And it, because I've done both and I can tell, you know, cops, I'll say, well, I don't know how you guys in the military do it. All I can say is guys in the military deploy for a year. They come back for a year to mm-hmm. two years and then they deploy. Mm-hmm. So we, we pack our trauma in, in bits and pieces. Whereas 
police officers and firefighters and paramedics, it's 30 years every day in yeah. and out. Yeah. And probably people don't understand the toll that that takes on people. And because of the stigma, nobody wants to ask for help. So where we are now is we're going to start training first responders to do the RTM. Mm. Uh, we have a sheriff's office in Florida that is looking at twenty training 20 of their deputy sheriffs. And one, once one agency does it, because they do critical incident stress management. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's an ineffective program because nobody wants to sit around and talk about the stuff that they just dealt with. Mm-hmm. Now they'll be able to run through the RTM within 24 hours of a traumatic event, reset the emotional state so it never becomes a problem. That'll change the whole conversation because at that point, it'll become more public, more accepted, and counselors will either have to get trained or they're just going to lose clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's a church in South Florida, um, Calvary Chapel. They want to train about 30 of their church counselors because they want to take it to the Bahamas and work with the hurricane victims. They want to take it to Puerto Rico right. to work with those hurricane and earthquake mm-hmm. victims. Mm-hmm. And they have a presence in the Middle East with the Syrian refugees. They want to take it to that world. Um, so it's it's going to open up um, to a much broader audience. Um, in um, in the UK, they, they're they doing a major study right now, their National Institute of Health. Um, they, they typically will do, they did four uh, counseling centers got trained and they were testing the results. And then 12 months later, they were going to do the next phase, but they had such success so quickly, they went ahead and within three months jumped to the next phase to train 12 clinics and then it'll go to the next phase. So they're getting ready to, to ramp it up in the UK as well. So it's it's gonna be a global movement because when you, you know, our motto is healing the hero uh, and anybody who has fought through trauma is a hero. Mm. I love that. It's so true. Yeah, It is true because, you, you know, all of us know somebody who's dealt with trauma yep. in one way or another. And so what you're doing is absolutely amazing. Congratulations. Thank and I can much. see the passion in, in a little tears, it looks like. I, it, it gets me <laughs> emotional because I know where we are. Mm-hmm. And we're so close to making this thing wide open. That is awesome. So. And I got to witness it uh, this week. And... Uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's hard to explain the protocol to it people. Is. So, you know, it. so that's why I encourage people to go to the website, to listen to the podcast, and to hear people's stories. Because really, people's stories are what um, is the important thing, is seeing the effect, the real effect on um, it's having on so many people. Yeah. So tell me about the resources that people, the website is 22 and the word zero. Mm-hmm. Dot com. Dot org. Dot org. org, Excuse me. Dot org. And then uh, the podcast is PTSD Free. Is the PTSD Free Podcast. The PTSD Free Podcast. And we're on pretty much most platforms, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, um, Stitcher. Okay. And then eligibility for the program is not just military vets or first responders. I I really want to hit this home uh, one time. that. There's a lot of people out there that are suffering, and they know who they are. Anybody that's listening to this right now, there's going to be life saved just from people listening to this. Yeah. You don't have to suffer with it. You, if you're a civilian and something happened to you when you were six, whether it was, um, you know, you were molested or you saw somebody get robbed at gunpoint or you know whatever, mm-hmm. some trauma's trauma. We've had people who have lost an animal and they couldn't even speak of losing that pet for years later. It just got stored in the wrong part of the brain. We can mm-hmm. fix that. Mm-hmm. So. You, and if it's something really bad and you're like, I just don't ever want to talk about it, I'm telling you we can fix it without talking about it. Yeah. You don't have to bear that cross and, and the pain that you're in. And we'll work with anybody. You can call Dan or I directly. Yeah. Um, we've cleared people from, I've cleared people in Florida over. I was going to say, is this an in-person <clears throat> process or can you do this over the phone with somebody or Zoom or one of those platforms? Typically, you want to be with the person because if somebody is actively suicidal and they mm-hmm. disconnect, you don't want to. But if somebody is just really struggling and they're normal, uh, we can do it remotely. Dr. Burke, I hope he doesn't listen to this. He'll, <laughs> he'll kill me for saying it. But in the world that we live in with the, with the veteran suicide rate, you can't hurt them. You know, you're right. just basically running them through visual formats and it will work just as successful. Um, we just request that somebody be in the room with them when they go through it. Do they have after effects, like physically after? I mean, they, yes. the, it's cleared, but are they, they tired? Or are they, they sleep. Is there, they sleep. They sleep. Uh, one of my soldiers that I ran through, he was a, an emotional wreck. And the next day when I followed up, I says, how was your sleep? He's on a CPAP and he sh- gave me a screenshot of his readout. And it was he slept for 10 hours and two minutes. 
he said he was in a mild coma. Um, but that's so it's what, probably emotionally draining. Yeah, because what happens is when you shut the amygdala down to the normal position, your body can finally rest. Oh. It's like, oh, thank you for get moving that. I, I need to take a nap here. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've seen guys, uh, Vietnam vets, World War II vets that have been getting treated with this. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's it will give you your life back. It will help you sleep. We've had people with chronic pain issues resolve. Now we got this lady with the cancer. I'm not saying that's what cured it, but you know, when your body is in a, a homeostasis state, your immune system, your immune system can do what it's right. supposed to do. Absolutely. In, yeah. Instead of your cortisol levels being, being, all, all, being all over the place and mm-hmm. your adrenaline levels being yeah. all over the place. Yeah. 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 It's, it's remarkable. And one of the things that we've gotten feedback on as well is that a lot of people go, I've got so much trauma. Where do I start? Mm. And they think they can't get rid of all of it. And, mm-hmm. and I just want to hit this one more time from my because I've heard this a lot on the civilian and folks who were not military first responders, it might take us a couple of sessions to find the right ones, but we, we can, you don't have to work through every single trauma you've ever had in your life. Usually it is that first one and the biggest one mm-hmm. and the rest of them go away. And okay. even if something else were to pop up, we can clear it and we work on it. So it's, it's not, it's not traumatizing. You don't have to go and relive all the horrible details of the event. You don't have to tell us about that. We can, we're going to ask you just to see the response and then afterwards ask you to, uh, after it's clear mm-hmm. <clears throat> but you don't have to so don't don't hold back on reaching out or, or con- yeah. connecting with us because you think you're gonna have to share this horrible information um, we, we can fix you and you uh, Dan are in Florida I'm in Florida and Nick you're in Mass yep. and so how can they reach you because our show is coming to an end but I want to make sure that people who are watching this and say like, you know what thank God this is available to mm-hmm. me and it's free yep and mm-hmm. so um, how can they reach you? Phone uh, number, website, what's it? Do you have a like a contact page on your website or does someone call a, you directly? There'll or? be a contact page, but I always give out my cell phone number. So you're comfortable doing that on the show? 863-221-6304. All right, so eight six say, say that eight, again. 863 yep. 221 and that's for Dan. Okay, and, and then my next. cell's 978-727-3888. Yep. Yep. And you can you can also reach me through uh, email at nd uh, November Delta uh, True North. Okay. At Gmail. All right. And do you have an email as well that you want to get? It's Dan. Yeah. At twenty two zero dot org. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that on the show so that people have that available to them. And I can't thank you enough, like the work that you're doing, and I'm so sorry that you had to go through that, but you've turned a negative into such a positive and you're making an impact on so many, and that's wonderful. If I hadn't gone through it, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing now. I get that. Yes, I I have my own story that led me to what I'm doing today, so I totally get that. And I think that that's where, you know, that's when something works because you've been there, you've lived it, and now you know You've taken that, what you've gone through, and turned it into your passion to help others. And I totally get that. And I think that's amazing. So congratulations. And Nick, you're doing wonderful work, too. And, you know, I got to watch you and and, and helping somebody. And um, I can't wait till we reconnect. I appreciate I know. you. Um, yes. You're always trying to help others. That's what I loved about you the first time we ever met. That's a whole story for another Yeah, day, that's a whole story for another thank, show. Thanks for having us on the show <laughs> and, and bringing us down. We Just getting the word out uh, mm-hmm. is huge for us. Uh, because it works and you can't unsee it once you see somebody get their life back man it's like it's it's amazing pts is an injury and we can now heal from it yeah that is so awesome and you know what it just happened to be that you came up i mean you weren't even supposed to be on the show and it just happened to coincide with your trip up here to see nick so i'm so grateful this is amazing so thank you both for coming on and thank you for for making an impact in the lives of so many Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in again to Talk Me Healthy. This is Sherry Keating. And remember to live your best life every day starting today. Thank you for tuning in. And I hope that you'll come back again next month. And until then, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.